and we are live at the Venture to Victory podcast. I'm your host, Tim Tanella, CEO of Matchstar Venture Search, and I'm super excited today because our guest, Dorian Keegan, is a Canadian entrepreneur based out of Montreal, and we want it to be really fun to talk to someone that's done a true startup up in Canada and to learn, you know, what the life was like growing up there, what what how entrepreneurialism is viewed. What's also really exciting is Dorian has been at the heart really for close to a decade in the AI field with his company, AI Redefined, I guess we go by the acronym AIR, and he's doing some very different things than maybe other companies building platforms and has a unique perspective on how we can do that, how we can build these platforms out and also in a more ethical way. So I think it's be fun to touch a little bit on his perspective on AI, the AI revolution, but both some of the dangers that we all talk about the dark side of AI. I know uh, anyone who's involved in it like Dorian has a perspective on that. I think people would find that really valuable. So, you know, this is fun for me because I have been to Canada. I've traveled all over the world and Canadians are very different people. I've enjoyed every time I've gone up there. I always said I've never met a Canadian I haven't liked. But on the entrepreneurial side, there's a strong entrepreneurial vibe that's going around Canada, even though it is a relatively small country compared to the United States. And I think the greatest place to start, Dorian, is really just like, what was it like growing up for you? When did you first start thinking about, hey, I should start a company? And then when you did, what was that whole ecosystem like in Canada? Um, and what were the good things and the strong things? Yeah. So first, pleasure being here. Thanks a lot Thank for you. the invitation. Uh, and uh, and yeah, so the so first element is where I'm truly Canadian is in Canada, there's a lot of people coming from multiple immigration part, and I'm one of them, right? So I'm not born in Canada. I'm actually born in Sweden. Oh. My father was French. My mother was Hungarian, just to add to a bit more complexity. And then I spent my childhood in Germany. Why not, right? Uh, <laughs> and spent some time also in France, in Hungary, uh, Austria, England. So, you know. And after that, eventually I became Canadian, but just, you know, I had to make sure that I, I do <laughs> a long country. road, a long road yes. to Montreal. Yeah. So yeah, you could consider me a Westerner. I've been okay. quite a bit. I think I fit within that sort of larger profile. Uh, uh, I, I think, uh, so before doing my company, which was founded seven years ago in 2017, my very first little bit, not necessarily in entrepreneurship, but intrapreneurship was when I uh, co-created Bio Montreal, which is a video game studio. Uh, that was back in 2009. Uh, okay. And we grew the studio from a few people to uh, 130 person, uh, worked on uh, the very well-known uh, Mass Effect franchise, uh, a lot of success there. This is the moment where I realized, wow, I really love doing this, right? Uh, you know, building a studio, growing a team. And uh, I think this is where I had a bit of a tick of like, yeah, I, I want eventually one day to create my own thing. Right? And, uh, and I would do that several years later in 2017. So found AI Redefine, which is called back then Age of Minds, but we renamed it uh, here in Montreal, Canada. And, uh, and it was a lot more difficult than I thought. A uh, few reasons for that. The first one is when you're building company for a company, what is amazing is you need money. You just call the CEO and you're like, hey, I think I'll need a few million this year. Here are all the reasons why. You may have a few other calls to talk about it, but that's it, right? Right. As getting funding is long, painful, usually <laughs> we're going to meet a hundred investor because before getting funding. So, uh, so, you know, for me, that was not used to it. It was a bit of a, of a shock, if you will, right? Uh, compared to the luxury of creating companies within existing companies, right? Right. The second element, and I think that goes a bit to, to your answer is, uh, 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 very good things in Canada. Notably, there's amazing talent in technology. In AI, most of the godfathers who are at the origin of modern AI and machine learning are Canadian, right? Rich Sutton is living in Edmonton. Uh, Joshua Benjo lives here in Montreal. Jeffrey Hinton lives in Toronto. I mean, you know, it's... But I never thought of it that yeah. way until you just put yeah. it all together. Yeah, it's the godfather of machine learning are essentially Canadian. And there is amazing talent when it comes to machine learning and AI here in Montreal. Still today, I think the biggest independent research in the world is happening here. And uh, there's amazing talent in simulation. There's amazing talent in video games also as well. So uh, uh, so great place from a talent point of view. But from a funding point of view, this is where things get complicated. It's really difficult actually to get a technology company funded here in Canada, right? And it's significantly more difficult than obviously the Silicon Valley. 
But the Silicon Valley, it's, it's kind of the exception, right? So uh, you shouldn't compare yourself necessarily to Silicon Valley. But I would argue it's more difficult to get funding for a technology startup in Canada than it is, for example, in Sweden, right? Mm -hmm. And now you're starting to compare a bit more Apple to Apple. Right? And one of the reasons of that is in order to have a healthy investment ecosystem, you usually need to have several big exit within that ecosystem, right? So obviously Silicon Valley, this is all the exit from the computing age and then the internet age, they're pretty much all there, right? So there is right. tremendous amount of capital, right? And it's the, and it's the Hollywood of technology is what I say. Yes, exactly. Exactly, exactly. Sweden, I mean, Spotify, it's Danish, Swedish people. There's several big technology play that has happened. They were enough to kind of fit the ecosystem there. But in Canada, you don't really have that. Like, or a bigger exit, the billion-like exit, or mostly in the domain of energy. And there's a good funding in energy, but when it comes to tech, uh, you know, I mean, there's Shopify, I guess, but you know, it's 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 relatively limited, right? And so, right. therefore, the ecosystem is is a lot less mature here, right? And and then I think the government was both brilliant and dumb at the same time. Brilliant in the sense that they recognized the importance of AI very early on, and they invented this tremendous amount of money in research and education. And as a result of that, Canada has one of the best education in machine learning in the world, which is amazing, and so amazing talent, but hasn't put any money to really, I mean, they have put some, but very little to bolster actual companies or Canadian companies or startup as England has been doing, putting a lot more for that where other countries have been run. And so as a result of all of that, you know, fast, fast forward to today, compared to seven or eight years ago, we're still amongst the top when it comes to education and research or academic research. But when it comes to companies, there are some interesting companies because of interesting talent, but there should be a lot more. Yeah. And yeah. I think this is, this is because of a difficulty of funding. So yeah. one story I, I often share is when I started to do my fundraising, that was uh, early 2018, um, I did it mostly in Canada and I was struggling. Uh, I was trying to raise uh, 2 to 2.5 million US roughly, right? And, and most of the feedback I got were like, eh, you're not fully ready. Or you know what, what could you do for half a million? Could you do anything for half a million? I would be like half a million, my budget is going to be, have you seen how much I paid the AI researcher? I mean, no, yeah. I cannot do much with half a million. Then I come to the Silicon Valley to fundraise and I get literally the opposite feedback is like, look, I love your project. Talent is great. Vision is great. But I, with two, 2.5 million, you, you won't get where you want to at least raise three or 3.5 million. And so I, yeah. I just ended up raising more. Because people wanted me to raise more because like, that no, had to be just su su that had to be such a wild feeling to have people who are investing, encouraging you. We need to raise more, spend more, grow quicker. Just a, the yeah. the philosophical difference from one place to another. Yeah, no, it's 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 crazy. Yeah. So and, and just also from uh, uh, because the funds are of different size, right? Yeah. When you have a half a billion or a billion dollar fund like you have uh, in the U.S., you can take the, the long game view, right? And, and so do what we call deep tech investment and say, I'm going to invest into something that is going to be big, but I know I need to have patient capital that is going to wait, you know, the sort of seven to 10 year horizon. Right? Mm -hmm. As most capital, because the fund are still face smaller in Canada, like there are $50 million found or, you know, hundred millions of dollar funds. It's just right. like, they love more shorter term. Like they're just like, we want to see results within five years. And in our case, we're a deep tech company back in 2017. And what we wanted to do, we're like, no, no, we need to do some research before we can do a product. And, you know, it's, it's, it didn't work, right? Uh, we're not doing a website or something that is immediate, like, you know, and so, uh, so, so yeah, it, 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 it was more difficult. Uh, uh, and then the last element is even today, the conversation I have in Canada are amazing about the technology itself. Again, it goes back to the amazing talent, right? When I'm in San Francisco, I tend to have less interesting conversation from a technology point of view mm. or execution point of view, but I have a lot more interesting conversation from a business point of view. And mm. from people who really have a good business acumen, entrepreneurship acumen is kind of part of the DNA, if you will, right? Yeah. And you, you tend to see that sort of profile more and more. Uh, U.S. entrepreneur or Canadian entrepreneur that just moved to the U.S., 
uh, you have your marketing and sales operation in the US uh, right. because those disciplines tend to be not that good in Canada. Mm -hmm. And then your tech team is in Canada. Yeah. And you see, and you see, by the way, we see that that's a typical kind of formula or structure for companies from all over the world, whether it's an Israeli company or a company that's a Chinese. A lot of people have their marketing and sales here in the United States. They're incorporated. They can say we're an American entity, be part of the Silicon Valley or Silicon Alley, you know, kind of fundraising ecosystem. And then the development work is all done behind the scenes somewhere else. And it seems to work pretty well. Yeah. 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 Very much agreed. That's great. Stepping back just kind of a little bit for a minute, some things that you did early on, I know that um, you got a master's in project management and that led to uh, becoming a producer for DC Studios, which is pretty good. DC and Marvel, we all know about that, certainly on the gaming side, and that you were instrumental um, in co-founding uh, BioWare's Montreal Studio. And I think uh, you said you led, you, you developed 17 different games, and including a couple, uh, which those gamers would know Mass Effect 2, which was the game of the year in 2010, Mass Effect 3, the RPG of the year in 2012. So how did you kind of make that transition from gaming and video game development to AI? Yeah. So I, I, I always loved video games, right? I've, I've been playing games since, 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 <laughs> since I'm a kid and it was my first career and my, my career, my choice very early on. Right. Right. And interestingly. I, I didn't see myself changing career because I, I just deeply uh, loved doing games. But nevertheless, uh, you know, after the success of the first Mass Effect theology, the success of building a studio, I had kind of a dream job. And despite all of that, my motivation started to to fall down, which was just really weird, right? Like people would yeah. to have this job. Why? What on earth is going on, right? And I thought that this may be franchise fatigue because I've been working on Mass Effect for so long, something like that. And yeah. It, it took me, so uh, Bauer slash Electronic Cards, they had a program where after seven years with them, you have a sabbatical, a two-month sabbatical, which is amazing. And it was the very first true time I was able to just fully disconnect, right? And be a lot more introspective. Uh, and this is when I really realized that the reason why I was starting to lose motivation was was because I had kids. Mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, first daughter born in 2014, second in 2016. They my life perspective changed, right? The first one is rather than thinking of my lifetime, now is thinking of their lifetime too, which just right. puts, you know, the time perspective on thing that is very different. But also, even though I still love making games and playing games, what I cared the most about was not releasing the best game possible. It was just making sure that my daughters have the best future possible, right? There's nothing more important to me than that. Right. And this was so we're back in 2014. And this was at a time where uh, I, during my sabbatical, I spent a lot of time thinking about kind of, you know, all the sort of major threats that are facing the next generation of people. Um, and so coming out of my sabbatical, I came down with kind of a list of five things I should work on if I really want to improve the future of my kids outside, obviously, being a good father. Number one was AI or human eye alignment. Very intense sabbatical. Some of my other friends that took sabbatical. They actually went to the beach. They surfed. They played guitar. <laughs> you took on the weight of the, the next several generations on your break. But it's because I was relaxing that I was able to think about that. Yeah. It's actually by getting on the beach. It's getting on the beach that you get those ideas, right? Yeah, it seems, um, it seems like the best ideas for me always come around water somewhere. I don't know. A lake, so, in the so shower, at the beach, at a pool. The business plan to create uh, the company I created happened on a hot tub. Oh my gosh. So yeah, water. Absolutely. Yeah. I fully agree. Right. You know, it's, 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 <laughs> water works. I think so. What, what's, that's, this is what I ended up focusing on is human AI line, right? So. I mean, this is a subject that is a lot more well-known, I would say, today. Even though, you know, there is a bit of fear-mongering or too much reassuring on those aspects, people are not very much grain on the point of view of that. But the general element goes uh, like the following, is with machine learning, for the very first time, we have essentially machine learning that learn by themselves, right? So they, they're not bound by a system of rule or command or guidance that is given. They're learning by themselves, right? Mm -hmm. um, and they're still quite far away from human capabilities, right? 
But when you think about this pillar of learning, they essentially based on three things. So it's three things that enable machine learning. There is computing, your all the capacity of population, if you will. There is the architecture of uh, an old web, kind of equivalent of your brain, right? Mm -hmm. and, and then there is the method of learning or the ways you learn, right? And, and if you look at each of them, you're like, okay, let's look at the computing point of view. Today, you know, my brain, your brain, it sees both uh, unconscious and unconscious together, the compute power of the laptop in front of me or this phone, right? Right. But how long is that going to last? I can tell you this is not going to last very long, right? <laughs> if you put everything into cloud computing, you can already reach compute that exceed human brain with a pace of technology is going to be, when we're yeah. talking here about several well, years at most. And if you add then, let's assume that we're capable to harness quantum computing for AI calculation purpose, for example, then you're just so miles, light years ahead of the human brain that, you know, that's a pillar that obviously the technology is going to get better than biology, right? For sure. The second pillar is the complexity of our brain still far exceeds any form of neural net that you have out there. But if you just look at the progress we had in the past seven years, about a neural net seven years ago versus one of today, you know, we're also on a path of eventually exceeding human complexity. Is it longer years than compute? Very likely, right? Maybe it's decades, but it's something that is very likely going to happen within this century, right? And then remains the method of learning, right? So we humans are learning through hundreds, thousands of different methods, right? Mm -hmm. uh, AI, modern AI, essentially, I'm, I mean, I'm going to exaggerate a bit, but essentially learn either by seeing pattern in large amount of data, so supervised learning or variant of that, or it learns by principle of trial and error, and so reinforced learning or variant of that, right? Mm -hmm. Obviously, there is new learning paradigm that at are being worked on and are evolving. And so same thing, you know, it's within a few couple of decades, you can reach a point where a machine learning system just learns with, you know, as, as organically, many different, yeah. yeah, as a human. But, you know, now think about it, bigger brain architecture than ours, a capacity to learn similar to ours and compute that is light year ahead of us. What do you think will be the result of this? Right. In, ter in terms of positive implications for the world or negative? I but guess that's the question. Ju ju just even before going positive and negative, what is the obvious implication is we'll have, we'll have birthed in intelligence that is going to mm -hmm. exceed ours, right? And it's something that we humans have never faced. We've always been the dominant intelligent form here on this earth, always, right? And we can see how this has gone for the other life form, right? right. So. So the big challenge is, you know, the uh, super intelligence can, can mean many things. I believe it won't be neutral, but it will have either a very positive impact on our society, maybe lead us to have a better society, to reach the next stage of civilization. Suddenly mm -hmm. we can go beyond all the human weaknesses because of AI. And, you know, think of science right. fiction book, like a culture from Ian Banks that describe kind of, you know, ideal societies that are possible only because of a sort of human AI, uh, uh, collaboration and human AI, uh, 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 um, synergy, if you will. Right. Or on the opposite, you have all this movie and there's plenty of them that are all about just AI wiping human out of the, of the human. Right. Which, you know, is on the negative possibility. It doesn't even have to be a terminal type, type of movie. Maybe, you know, the AI has a sort of guidance to preserve life on Earth. And the conclusion will be that the biggest threat to life on Earth is human versus the other life. And, you know, that's just the end of it. Well, that's the, that's, the term, that's the Terminator idea. Or I think a lot of people can get some more of um, two AI systems battling it back to determine whether it can be a winner in a nuclear war and which direction they go. That's kind of the apocalyptic view of it. But I look at it a little bit too, like... Um, um, you know, someone who could do very little math, if they had a calculator in their pocket, they could do incredible calculations without that knowledge. There's a symbiosis between the machine and the man. And whether it's a neural network we're physically connected to a machine or just think of what we, the power we have in a cell phone today. Think of the power every individual is. Think of what the power of a 12-year-old is 
with that phone in their hand, their ability to reach out to people, to learn new things, to move their body through different types of transportation mechanisms, to, to, to purchase, acquire, to make their presence known. That's just with the cell phone. So what's going to happen, like you said, as is merging between machines and man really grows over the next decade. It's fascinating. Yeah, absolutely. And so here, here's the element. I, I don't know if, if the outcome is going to be good or bad, and no one does, right? The only thing I can do is try to nudge it towards better outcome rather than worse outcome. I think this is what everyone can do, right, if you will. Yeah. And so thinking about it, one of the critical outcome or conclusion I came on, because it's very likely going to happen, maybe during not my lifetime, maybe it is, maybe it's during my kid's lifetime, doesn't matter. It will, it will happen very likely within this century, is we need to make sure that, that, that a, or AIs in general have a positive impact on humanity, right? So it's referred at to, or you can see it in the academic as a human AI alignment problem, right? The big mm -hmm. issue that basically AI is, human, is aligned with humans, right? And uh, uh, my, in order to do that, I think there's three things that need to happen. Number one, I need to be widely accessible. If it's not widely accessible, it's not going to be aligned to humanity. It's just going to be aligned to a sub-portion of humanity. Right. So, the, so that, that, that separation of the haves and the have-nots grows exponentially. Yeah, And these are not new ideas. OpenAI was founded on those principles, right? And you have several other companies were founded with that. The second one is in order for humans to be able to keep a bit of a pace of progress with AI, we need to figure out a way to link AI and human in a faster way than a keyboard voiceover like, right? I'm a big believer into some form of brain interfacing, right? Mm -hmm. uh, which, you know, could be... Uh, you know, directly, a Neuralink style could be maybe a device on the top of it, whatever it is, right? But we need to figure out a way to just have human connect at a faster pace to AI, right? If we want to be able to, to evolve together, right? And then the third and last one, uh, and this is what I founded the company on, is uh, figuring out systems so that AI learn from human and human learn from AI, right? Uh, and probably if you go back to 2017, 2017 was very much about AI learning from, I mean, 2017, AI was very much about vision, right? And the reason why is the vast majority of AI machine learning was about seeing pattern in large amount of data. And what we have in large amount of data is pictures, so, you know, seeing patterns among pictures, thus vision, right? Mm -hmm. But you have very few meaningful interaction in the training of an AI with a human. AI were not learning directly from interaction with humans, right? And so this is really what, that was the vision of our company, is we going to solve that as a problem. And why we need to solve that is because we need to figure out how you can have human learn from AI, AI learn from human, and essentially figure out how yeah. to have that synergistic collaboration or relationship between the two. Because if eventually the two becomes heavily codependent on one another and grow together, likelihood of them being and aligned just becomes weaker and weaker. Yeah, for sure. I know that you, last time we spoke about six or seven months ago, you had invested part of the AI in developing applications for flight training. I thought that was really interesting because I have a daughter right now who is studying to be a commercial aircraft pilot. Oh, that's awesome. In school, aviation sciences, Amazing. flies all the time. And the use of simulators and you have the pilot next to you and that interaction of the pilot that has so many diverse experiences some are technical and some are adaptive and others are emotional, right? You're in a pressure situation, you know, bad weather or some, something happens, a technical issue with the aircraft. You know, how do you incorporate that into the training? And I feel like AI would have a, a, a compelling part of that. So I'd love to get your perspective oh, since I know you're actually absolutely doing that before. So yeah, I, I can tell you a bit more about it. So I'll start a bit with a business problem, and then I'll explain a bit what is our solution. So it's something we have for pilot training, but it's something mm -hmm. we have also for air traffic controller. Those are profession in high demand. So congratulations to the daughter. They want pilots right now. We lack pilots. Yes. And we deeply lack pilots. In Canada, last summer, uh, they had to console several flights due to a lack of air traffic controller and pilots, right? So oh my gosh. just tells you how 
how this is something prevalent. Uh, the other thing is I think the average age of pilot is extremely old. You know? yeah. And so within yeah. the next five to 10 years, most of them will not going to retire. Yeah, and so they're, they're, they're forced in many cases. Worse, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's, that's the first problem. The second problem, as your daughter probably knows, is the training process is super expensive, oh. time consuming, yes, uh, uh, and uh, and highly dependent on flight instructor. You know, this pilot that we want to have fly plane, well, they have to keep flying pilots also as well. But we, we, I, we, I've gone through that exact thing with her, where you can't get on a schedule, something changes. There's yeah. such high demand, so yeah, you, yeah. There, there, there could be a better solution. Yeah, absolutely. And so, uh, and the last element is a flight instructor usually has a one-to-one -one relationship or is just handling a few trainees, right? Right. Uh, so, you know, it doesn't scale really well. So you have a problem of uh, uh, not ever training. And the last, last stat, the turnover is insane. I think air traffic control is something like 40% in really? uh, wow. uh, commercial pilots. I think it's huge. It's close to the 30%. Of just wow. people dropping out, right? Yeah. Often expanding and lengthy training, right? So yeah. in a yeah. domain where we lack people. So there's plenty of reason to figure out a way how to address that problem, right? And so the idea here is you take a portion of a curriculum and have it driven by an AI, right? And what is the value out of this? Well, uh, the first value is a practical value, right? You don't have to schedule based on the availability of the trainer, right? Right. As you know, I know you have kids, you just put them to bed, it's 11 o'clock, <laughs> there is no way you can get a human trainer. Well, the AI is available. It doesn't care, it doesn't sleep. Right? Yeah. <laughs> the second element is the AI scales. It can train a thousand people at the same time or hundreds of thousands, and the amount right. of compute you throw at it, but you know, it, it's not limited, if you will, right? Uh, and so it allows you essentially to do what we call train anytime, anywhere at your own pace, right? And that just is amazing in just lowering all the sort of drop-off problem and, and also scaling where the human uh, uh, flight instructor cannot, right? Yeah, for sure. And so how it functions is, so within a simulation, when you do training on a simulation, one of the challenge very often is that uh, the challenges that are presented to you, uh, it's, it's, it's common in the beginning that they're just too challenging. You don't even have the skills or knowledge to understand the problem or why you failed. And because you don't, you don't learn, right? And this is one of the big roles of flight instructors to accompany you on, right? And recently, more towards the end of your training, uh, you can be thrown with plenty of scenarios that you're very familiar with and just doing them, but you're not learning either, right? Maybe you're honing right. a bit some skills, but that's about it, right? And so one of the big challenges is to figure out how to optimize the training. So you are put in a situation where you eventually fail, but you have the skills and knowledge to understand why you failed to get better, okay. right? And so, Interesting. And so the, the way the eye function is it essentially does two things. The first one is it kind of does a sort of personalized curriculum for you, right? And, you know, this is based on not only data on students, but also a lot of insights from the instructor and the like, but basically trying to assess, if you will, where you are. And then basically based on your strengths and weaknesses, it's going to generate scenarios, right? And so let me take a scenario that's imagine, that, for example, I have a scenario where I'm going to, uh, you're at high altitude, you have a, a decompression problem, uh, mass falling off and one panics, and basically you need to bring the plane to a lower altitude, right? And to be able to repressurize the, the cabin, right? Um, and, you know, I'm going for my scenarios as a trainee, and I'm doing pretty well. I'm following exactly all the checklists point by point. But you know what? I'm taking my sweet time. And in this situation, you cannot take your sweet time. You need to be fast, right? And so the AI sees that, and what it's going to do is it's sure going to generate another scenario where if I'm not fast enough, I have a very fast game of a situation, right? And then another one that where I need to be faster and again and again until I get and understand that I need to be fast in the situation, right? So it's, 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 it's adapting. In many ways, it's kind of, you know, you're learning by trial and error, a bit like mm -hmm. the reinforcement learning approach in, in, in machine learning training, but adapted to a human. Yeah, it's incredible. I can see, obviously, enormous military applications for this too. Every area that you have to be trained and trained quickly, you become a resource, speed, speed is important. So I could see that application applying not just yeah. to aircraft, but really any, any large piece of equipment. Yeah. 
she felt that commercial airline pilot training was expensive. It's horribly expensive. <laughs> Jet fighter pilot is another level <laughs> of expensiveness. Yeah, I think. Well, that's amazing. So tell me real quickly. So we've talked a little bit about what you're doing in the AI field. We know there's endless questions. Many science fiction books have been written and are being written today about this future, potentially a, a bright future, potentially a dark future for us. Where do you see, I know you sit on, I think on some type of ethical committee, and I know there's been groups of people like Elon Musk have talked about, we need to slow down and really think about the ethics of how we develop this technology before it's too late. Where do you really sit on that? And do you, do you see collectively as the developer community, are people moving in that direction or are they just kind of letting it pass by them? That's a great question. And I, yeah, it's been an active topic in the past couple of years. It's interesting. My position will be a bit grayer because you have a sort of big black and white where we need to stop and slow down uh, and be extremely careful to, you know, everything is good. Let's keep going. Let's not lose competition versus China and all the other arguments. That's right. Yeah. And, and if they're both right and wrong at the same time, that's my perspective. And I'll, I'll try to explain a, a bit better here. Uh, is there a long-term major risk on AI? Absolutely. For all the reasons I mentioned earlier on, right? It's, it's, it could be our last invention, if you will, right? And human AI alignment is a massive problem. But the incentives are so huge. We're a society based on incentives, right? And probably capitalism is so much based on the incentive of making money and making money with new cheap labor. AI is that new cheap labor. There is no way you can slow that down, right? Yeah. And if you can slow that down, maybe on... Half of the country on earth, you still have the other half of the country are going to work on it, right? So all you're doing is you're increasing the risk of having it explode in other countries with maybe rest regulation, less oversight and the like, right? So the path of slowing down, don't see how it can work, right? Or, or maybe there is a way, but it's such, I mean, if there's a way to make the slowdown uh, path work, then there is a way to solve uh, uh, climate change, right? Because it's essentially political will yeah. at that point, right? And as we haven't been able to solve climate change, I don't have a big hope of solving how to slow down the yeah, progress, right? Yeah. So all we can do is really try to push that progress to, again, orient it more towards, uh, towards a good outcome, right? And so I'm a believer that we should invest significantly more on human AI alignment. I'm a believer that we should regulate more and regulate more in a smart way. I know Europe is already starting to do it own, so it's not about losing competition. It's just making sure that we're not doing some crazy unethical thing. But, so a good example is think of it as social media, right? Social media appeared in 2006, 2007. It took us a decade to get regulation about people should not be able to do anything they want with your private data, right? Right. And now, you know, it's something that has some form of regulation and people are aware of it, right? Well, it's a bit the same with AI. It's just that the consequences are just far beyond what we just see in social, right? And so I think there needs to be a lot of effort in regulation and there needs to be a lot more investment on things that are human alignment. And those investments should be coming at the government level because you want to make sure that, uh, uh, you know, it's essentially, it's more than public safety, right? It's species safety at that point, but it needs to be outside, if you will, of the more traditional private sector that is just trying to optimize for how to create yeah. the most optimum business. Yeah, it, it seems somewhat like a nuclear arms race in, in, in a sense of if there's one bad actor or, or one actor that has either too selfish an intent or maybe a dark intent and they move forward the technology, everybody else has to kind of keep pace. And, and again, who solves that? Businesses are not going to get it together and create an ethical framework to do it. I mean, governments are going to have to do it, right? Because the capitalism will favor the entity itself and the shareholders and the people running those companies. That, that's the stated goal is to grow bigger and to make money and employ people. Yeah. And they, they tend to stay somewhat neutral. It's the governments that come and play and say, how do we get together? How do we regulate this? Like I said, whether it's climate control, nuclear arms, um, whatever it's been, I think the world has not really had wonderful success collectively getting together. So I don't know how it's going to end. I, I agree with you though, that, you know, the genie is out of the bottle. It's moving forward. The best that we can do right now is try to participate, work with good companies, work with ethical companies, work with companies whose mission is to do something positive for humanity. 
and hope for the best and hope that we have leaders, political leaders who understand technology, number one, and bring that same type of moral construct to it. So some prayers in there too. So two quick things I wanted to wrap it up with that I thought would be interesting. So one is, what would your advice be to a Canadian startup understanding uh, that the ecosystem is small and that you sometimes run into issues around funding? Do you think it's best for them to set up shop in the United States, incorporate here, do their back office, and then raise funding on that basis? Or Because I know you've had some success and you've kind of gone through, like you said, you've got to go through 100 people just to get some positive positive feedback and a and potentially some money in the door, and it's not always easy, and it's an up and down cycle. And it's a cycle that also never really ends, right? It's not like, hey, we just ra- we went through this, we raised some money. Okay, that's just a limited amount of money till that next milestone, the next funding round. So it's 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 an ongoing process to exit, basically. Yeah. So 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 very 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 good question. From a funding point of view, don't limit yourself to Canada for sure, right? Go in the U.S. Even go to Europe. We have some European investors, right? Mm-hmm. But uh, travel and, uh, and and make sure to, to think of investment as a world. And obviously, if you're doing tech and AI, yeah, you should be spending some time in Silicon Valley because this is still where most of the funding are. Now, for incorporation, this is a very interesting subject. Very value in incorporating Canada. If you have a team that is working on uh, cutting neck technology, you're doing a lot of research that hasn't been done before, Canada has one of the most generous research program, tax incentive program. Uh, you can have up to 70% of your team founded for tax credit, which is insane, right? Wow. Uh, uh, so if you're a deep tech company, probably stay in Canada and keep your tech team in Canada, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, on the opposite, if you're doing things that are not relying on other technology, what you need is a lot more sales force, a marketing force, things like that. Then yeah, you have a lot more incentive to... To incorporate in the U.S., you'll be probably closer to your clients and to get the business going. And now, what, again, a lot of companies end up doing is both, right? Where they well, have an incorporation think, yeah. in the U.S., one in Canada, and have the sort of technical know, know-how that is in Canada, probably in machine learning, because there's yeah. amazing talent there, but it was going to be way cheaper than what you get in Silicon Valley. And, uh, and then you have all the tax incentives. But then you can have your head of marketing, your head of sales that are, uh, uh, you know, U.S. based, and they're going to to deal with clients who are significantly larger than the clients that we're getting in Canada. Yeah, yeah, we've seen in our, in our own business as as recruiters working with companies, particularly Canadian, Canadian companies. A lot of times, the senior leadership team they want to build them in the United States. They're looking for Americans, even if they're not going to incorporate here in the United States or just say wholly in, in Canada. A lot of times they'll still just set up an office. It's not incorporated. It's just a, an office and a lease. So they can have people in New York and places like that where they have access to talent and yes. they kind of operate between both worlds. So I think that makes a lot of sense. I think the last thing is because you're still kind of in startup mode a little bit, not really startup mode. It's been around for a long time, but in terms of stage of development, where you guys are in terms of that journey, I know there's been a lot of ups and downs. There are for anybody. I've rarely ever talked to any... The one thing I have in common with very successful entrepreneurs is they they tried and failed many times, but they got back on that horse because it was important to them. And they liked that, uh, the excitement of never giving up and having that one opportunity to kind of do something that's highly impactful in the world, in some cases for humanity, as we discussed earlier. What advice would you give to entrepreneurs and, and anywhere, not just uh, Canada, Canada, obviously, but here in the United States, who are struggling, who are had great ideas. They started off in a with a big boom and excitement, they were able to get people to join the party. Funding dried up. We went through some rough periods. What would you advise to them to kind of stick it out, try to make it to that next level based on someone who's been there and done that many times before? A great question. So it, it actually ties to when people ask me, what advice would you give? I always give the same advice, always. So to be successful as an entrepreneur, you need essentially to... Two skills that are almost the opposite towards each other, right? You need to have, on, on one hand, an immense stubbornness, right? Because there's so many people that are just going to tell you it's a bad idea or no. But if yeah. you don't believe in yourself, you don't believe in your company, if you don't keep going, if you don't have that resilience, you just abandon. And, you know, all the successful entrepreneurs have just not abandoned, right? That's been one of the key common area. I would say the because of always luck, luck, but luck is not an advice I can give, right? But right. Uh, uh, it's that sort of stubbornness and high resilience. On the opposite of it, probably in startup land, 
you need to be highly adaptable. If you do not adapt, you eventually die, right? Uh, and, and, you know, sometimes of all the feedback that you receive, there is plenty that doesn't make sense. Uh, there is plenty that, that you have to, to go through in a stubborn way, but there might be one or two feedback that are just like, oh my God, I need to pivot my company, otherwise I die. And so it's difficult. You need to be two persons that are different. You need to have two different personality, stubbornness and adaptability. Right? Yeah. I think one of the takeaways from this call, which I think has been really awesome for me personally, is this idea of you started to get a little burnt out maybe in terms of energy. And then when you took that break, you kind of reinvigorated by saying, hey, I'm building a family and children for the future. And all of a sudden that priority as a father uh, and, and someone that wanted to leave something, a better world with, with better potential for my children became that big theme. And you rediscovered that drive, meaning and purpose in the first place. And so I think that's really fascinating because a lot of times entrepreneurs, when they start getting into it, they do run into the struggle between, you know, having to work 24 seven is what you need to do. Obviously the endless, um, almost, <laughs> right. We almost did this. We almost died. We right. It's an endless process and it takes a lot of strength, courage, and will to do that. It's a balancing act against your family. And I see this all the time with, with candidates, right? Do I go back into a startup because I have a commitment I owe to my family and it's very difficult emotionally on me, time-wise on me. And that idea of not looking at the family as a conflict with the mission, but looking at the mission as being the purpose for the family and their future. And if you could sell that to your spouse and your kids, I think that's a good thing. But I, I think that's a very Thank interesting you. point that, you know, you can, can came to that conclusion on a sabbatical. So, hey, Jordan, it's been really wonderful. Where can people find you? Well, you know, we have a website, which is ai-r.com. Uh, if you want to contact through there, uh, you can send me a you know, message on LinkedIn or, mm -hmm. you know, whatever other, other different presence or I don't know. Or uh, visit Montreal Twitter, which, in January you know, or February, right? Yes. Temperature is amazing. If you <laughs> like snow and cold, you're going to be happy. It's best time to visit. I'm not too difficult to find in general. Well, thank you so much. It was a fascinating call. Really appreciate your insights into the AI world and, and what it's like to be an entrepreneur. And really appreciate it, Dorian. Thank you so much. It's been my pleasure, Tim. You too. Take care. Thanks. Bye. The Venture to Victory podcast is provided by Matchstar Venture Search. If you're interested in any of our open executive roles, or need help sourcing world-class talent for your company, check out our website at matchstar.com.